Today is National Indigenous Peoples Day. Since 1996, this day has been used to celebrate and recognize the cultures and contributions of Canada's Indigenous population. Here in Lloydminster, the Native Friendship Centre is holding a wide range of events to celebrate the day. The festivity started at noon with a barbecue and a prayer from an elder. A powwow with band and music followed. A cultural trade show with youth activities will take place all day. The Native Friendship Centre president says each year the event keeps getting bigger. We get more, uh, more people coming from the city and uh, more activities. So it has grown a lot. And in the last two, three years, we haven't been able to have a celebration because of COVID. So this year is pretty special. The Friendship Centre hopes that uh, today is not just used to celebrate Indigenous culture and traditions, but also to showcase the services offered by the Centre to people of all backgrounds. Getting people together, that's what we'd like to, uh, I guess, put out there to the community like we provide services here not just for indigenous people anybody that comes through our door is provided a service that they require so regardless if it's national aboriginal day our friendship center is open to everybody and that means a lot to see this number of people here today Council had a lengthy discussion about uh, the license of occupation policy during the last meeting the policy is about the use of signage and other items within the right-of-way and deems what will be allowed and won't be allowed to maintain a license of operation. Those are maintained by public dollars. If there's obstacles, they have to go around them. Then some have to clear with the weed eater. So there's, uh, there's some additional expense. But also we heard from the business community that it was important that they have access in some cases to that. The if the policy passes, people will have to pay $200 to apply for a license of occupation. Some councillors believe that for those who are not in compliance, the penalty should be put into place. There needs to be some consequences for those that are prepared to take advantage of that and not pay at all. Uh, we have to mow around it, we have to you know, check to make sure that things are in good shape and, and that signs are up there appropriately and, and in the end, uh, it's possible that you have people that buy their license and they're in compliance and then they're shortchanged because there's others that aren't paying, and that's not fair. Council moved to discuss the policy further at a future meeting after administration does some more research. Hopefully we can get something that's clear, concise, and as fair as we can be to as many people as possible, including the taxpayer. To celebrate the 100th anniversary of IODE Alberta back in 2020, a project started to raise funds for the Alberta Council of Women Shelters. Now the shelters received a generous contribution of $100,000 to go towards training to support children who have experienced domestic violence. Our Shelby Clark has the details. Joining us today for Primetime Local News is Jan Reimer with the Alberta Council of Women Shelters. Thank you so much for taking the time once again to speak with us. And thanks for having me today. We really appreciate it. Of course, no problem. You know, we were just saying this a little bit earlier, but this is a big thing happening. IODE donating $100,000 for trauma-informed children's curriculum training in shelters. So let's just kind of get started with this and be able to help get the word out there. What exactly was this donation all about? Well, it was marking their 100th anniversary, and they, we've had a long relationship with IODE over the years. Uh, they've supported children's programming um, in shelter for decades. And so when they approached us about um, you know, giving $100,000 or raising $100,000 uh, uh, for our children's programming, we were over the moon. Uh, and to consider that they also raised this money during a pandemic when it's really tough to get out and about and can't hold events is really amazing. So we are truly, truly grateful for all the work that they did to make this happen. And what was that reaction like in the response once, you know, the Alberta Council of Women Shelters heard about this, this announcement for receiving this generous donation from IODE? Well, I think we're all really excited and we've been working really hard to make those dollars stretch uh, and also to make sure that we have a really top notch curriculum uh, to offer uh, shelter staff uh, who are working with children in shelter. A lot of people don't realize, you know, how, that you think about women's shelters, they don't think about kids. 
uh, but you're more likely if you open a shelter door to hear the voices of children first and foremost, because mothers bring their children uh, to be safe. So being able to intervene, to have those practical skills is vitally important. And for that $100,000 helping, of course, with the training, is there more initiatives that the Council uh, of Women's Shelter is using that money towards as well? Well, it's, uh, it's putting it both, uh, we modernize the curriculum because the other thing that happens is with the, uh, the science of brain development is continually evolving. So what might have been true five years ago, we know so much more uh, today. So we wanted to incorporate the newest knowledge possible. We wanted to make it interactive on an online learning platform, which is something new for us. And um, so we were moving forward on that front. And we also wanted to incorporate the calls to action from the TRC as it relates to children. So each of the modules now has that piece in it um, as one of their learning objectives. So we really did a major revamp and we've already offered the um, training in person to some shelter staff who really, really have uh, appreciated the difference that it could make it because it's practical knowledge. It's not just understanding the science of brain development, it's giving them tools to apply in shelter. And I know you were already bringing up a little bit, but could we also expand on just why you believe it's the, the importance of having this for this type of training for the shelters? Well, often uh, people may not realize that uh, training in domestic violence um, is not an automatic thing. You can graduate today in Alberta as a social worker, as a psychologist in any profession and virtually not have to take a course on understanding the dynamics of domestic violence but everybody knows somebody. And certainly it shows its ugly head in every profession. Uh, so having that knowledge is vitally important. So when shelters are recruiting and they're wanting to hire people, it may very well be that they've never had any study on uh, the impact of domestic violence, let alone the impact on children. And so this curriculum helps to uh, further that knowledge um, and also support shelters uh, in getting the training that they need at a very practical level. Well, it's really good to hear that this uh, donation is going towards this program with the training and how important this is, of course, with children and family in the community. So I'm really glad you were able to receive this donation. And for people out there that are interested in just finding out more information, where can they go online to be able to just see more about this? Well, you can always visit our website at acws.ca. There's lots of information about uh, violence, about the impact of children right there on the webpage. And, you know, if they're aware of anyone in their lives who may be experiencing domestic violence, mm -hmm. um, help connect them to uh, shelters. Uh, you don't have to go to a shelter to uh, stay and want to um, get their help. Uh, you just have to call them up and often people after you know everybody wants to tell a friend a neighbor or a family member but if that family member member is then able to connect them with appropriate supports it makes a world of difference so there is information on our website about that as well perfect well once again thank you so much for joining us today jan it's always nice to be able to speak with you and congratulations once again to the women's shelters just for receiving this donation i know you will put it to good use and help all the families out there Thank you, and a big thank you as well to IODE. Uh, thanks, Shelby. Welcome back. Farmers are always looking for new ways to improve and maintain land and pasture. Our Thomas Wildman has more on a new AAFC study. Sean Aslin, a researcher with AAFC, and he is here today to tell us about his research into perennial grassland forages that he's going to be trying to use in cattle. And so thank you so much for being with us today, Sean. Hi, Tom. It's great to be here. And so, Sean, tell us about this new native grasslands and how what you're kind of looking for with this research and what it's going to do for the cattle industry. Sure. So um, I'm a forage breeder with Agriculture and Ag Food Canada, and uh, my program is focused on uh, developing uh, native seed stock for forage production for uh, primarily uh, Western Canada, uh, Southwest Saskatchewan is where I'm located. So uh, we do a lot of work on developing uh, seed stocks with improved characteristics to make it easier for producers to work with native plant materials. This includes select making selections for improved establishment, better persistence, as well as other end uses uh, like our forage quality, as well as our, our forage yield. 
researching a new kind of forage that is with more native grasslands. Kind of tell me a little bit more about that research project. We use a, a pretty wide variety of different species in the program. We have about 20 different species at, at different stages. Some of them are, are native plants that you're probably a little bit more used to. Uh, some of the, the dominant grasses uh, native to Western Canada. So uh, right now we're doing quite a bit of work on northern wheatgrass, uh, plains rough fescue, uh, as well as some newer grasses that aren't commercially available, uh, like Cydos gramma. And we're also in the process of developing uh, various native legumes. These include uh, species of prairie clovers, uh, milk vetches, as well as uh, other vetches that uh, we are uh, hoping to bring to market in the next couple of years. What advantages would this give the average producer with these new legumes? Legumes are, are really uh, interesting from an ecological sense because they, uh, they fix nitrogen in the soil. Uh, we do have a limited number of legumes that are adapted here to Western Canada. So to be sometimes that issues with cold tolerance and persistence over time. One of the benefits of working with native legumes is that they've been here for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, they're well adapted to the climate of the region. So we are looking at, we are developing uh, various populations of native forages that have some characteristics that make them a little bit easier to work with. So just an example, reducing uh, seed hardness in, uh, in native legumes or reducing seed dormancy. Uh, these are traits that they, they work really well in the wild, but uh, if you're trying to actually seed this into a situation either to um, rehabilitate uh, a pasture land or uh, to improve uh, range land condition, uh, we run into issues where you, know, you put it in one year and may not show up till the second or third or fourth year after establishment. So it, it's, tr it's essentially what it boils down to is making the, the new tools uh, for producers so that it's easier for them to establish these materials based on their genetics, um, as well as just uh, um, essentially reducing the risk involved of working with native plant materials. So if you put it in the ground, it's, it's going to come up. That's what we're moving towards planning on introducing this into the common market? We have uh, different species that are at a variety of different stages. So it depends on, ultimately what it depends on is how much improvements needed to, to move a population in a certain direction. In, in some cases, it's simply a matter of us collecting seed and increasing it. If the species has a lot of traits that, make, that are already easy for it to, uh, to work with, um, we can look at you know, less than a five-year time span to have from collection to release. Uh, but realistically, for most for most breeding programs, when you are starting fresh, you are looking at between a 10 to 15 year cycle uh, to really see advancement because uh, breeding is an incremental process. So it's kind of little baby steps, each cycle selection and each cycle can take between uh, three to four years, depending on the species. Uh, but we're always working on new techniques to speed up that process. And that could be either things like uh, genomics or phenomics that we use to, to kind of speed up the selection cycle. What has been kind of the support that you guys have received from producers in terms of any testing you've done with this program? So we, we have a lot of support from uh, various producer groups uh, for this type of research, and that's always, uh, always really appreciated to see. Uh, we're always happy uh, to meet with, uh, with groups and uh, get feedback regarding any native plant materials. Uh, it's really, it's the producers where we get that information on, okay, what species are they looking for, or what are the primary production challenges that we have. Uh, so it's always great to have that feedback, and we always appreciate the support. Thank you so much for all the information, Sean, and we hope you have a great day. You as well. Thanks, Thomas. And now here's a look at today's agriculture prices. Midwest Prairie Pirates U18 baseball team is having one of their strongest seasons they've ever had. Our Adil Ahmed has a story on why the Pirates are on a roll. Base hits. And strikeouts are just two of multiple reasons as to why the Midwest Prairie Pirates have had the season they've had so far in the Baseball Bird Elite League. Coming into this past weekend, they were 18-2, heading into their matchups against the St. Albert Cardinals. Pitcher Brody Wrench is another reason for the team's success, leading the league in strikeouts with 54. I feel pretty good. I feel confident out there. 
and I just trust my stuff and I just roll through and defense backs me up. Another player who's been a key figure on the Pirates is second baseman Brendan Pollard who has 41 runs on the season which is second best on the team. Last year I struggled a little bit more but this year I hit the ball hard and hit the ball in the gaps and I use my speed and try my best to you know do what I can. It's no secret the Pirates are having fun out on the field due to their success so far this season. However, the team does understand when to lock in at all times. Great group of guys. They keep it fun. They keep it relaxed. But uh, when we need to, we really dial in. And uh, it's a great atmosphere to be around. The Pirates played the Cardinals over the weekend four times, winning all matches and now having a record of 22-2 and two on the season. Despite the dominance, the Pirates are echoing the same message as to what they can work on moving forward. Doing the little things well. Uh, we're pretty good at all like the big things, pitching, hitting, fielding, but it's just our little mistakes that really cost us. Take care of the baseball, do the little things, and we'll, we'll be just fine. With the Pirates winning four games over the weekend here, they have now won 15 of their last 16 games as they head over to their next matchup in Calgary when they take on the Bucks Yellow at Foothill Stadium on July 9th and 10th. For Primetime Local News, I'm Adil Ahmed. One player from Ice Wars made a generous donation to Kids Sport here in Lloydminster. Travis Slavitsky donated $15,000 to Kids Sport here in the city. The money was raised from his fights with Ice Wars through the help of sponsors. Kids Sport says the donation was something that caught them by surprise. Travis kind of called me out of the blue. Super appreciative. Lloydminster is full of a lot of very worthwhile nonprofit associations, so the fact that he chose us is pretty amazing. Sports has just been really beneficial in my life, and uh, you know, if it's beneficial in my life, I'm sure it's beneficial in other kids' lives. So, Levitsky says he plans to raise more money to donate to kids' sports in his next fight that will take place at the River Creek Casino on August 6th. And now it's time to head on over once again to Shelby Clark, who has an extended look at our evening weather forecast. Thank you so much again there, Jace. Now taking, yes, another extended look at your weather forecast. We will be checking out temperatures across the provinces here. We will be starting off with our central area. We are seeing some nice warm temperatures in each of the zones so far from what we have been seeing. Starting off with the Alberta set in the central zone, we are seeing most temperatures past that 20 mark. So we are warming up quite a bit from what we have been seeing earlier on in the week. Uh, Jasper is just a degree cooler there at 19 degrees. Most spots are just reaching that 21 mark and it is 23 in both Red Deer and Athabasca, while Edmonton is just at 24. Switching now over to our Saskatchewan side to check them out. They are seeing some uh, slightly warmer temperatures as well, maybe slightly cooler compared to the Alberta side, but still looking not too shabby. Uh, over in Melfort, they are just hitting 18 degrees, while there's 21 in most spots, and Meadow Lake is 20 with us here in the border city as well, over in Cold Lake at 22 degrees. Now switching over to our northern zone now, they are seeing some warmer temperatures, continuing that warm streak compared to what they saw yesterday as well. They are definitely warming it back up. Up. Wollaston Lake is probably the coolest over on this end at 16 degrees, uh, 22 over in South End and up in Stony Rapids, 23 in most spots on this side in Uranium City is seeing the warmest there at 24. Switching back to our Alberta side here, they are seeing some nice temperatures as well. Uh, Slave Lake is just hitting that 20 mark while Grand Prairie is a couple degrees cooler compared to the rest. 22 over in Peace River and the rest are looking slightly warmer with 24 and 25. So we are seeing a nice beautiful day for most spots across the provinces from what we are seeing so far. And going over to our southern zone, they're kind of matching with us in the central area, seeing between 22 to 24 degrees in most spots. Over in Banff, they're a few degrees cooler there. And switching over to our Saskatchewan side, they are seeing some nice temperatures as well. Uh, Regina and Yorkton twinning there at 18 degrees, 22 over in Swift Current and Kindersley, while Estevan has just reached that mark and Moose Jaw is at 23. But now going back across the region, seeing what we will expect throughout our evening for our forecast. Uh, we'll be pretty happy temperature-wise, I would say, as well, because we are seeing those double digits continue on for our evening low temperatures, which I think we're all excited to see. You know, it is patio season now, being the first day of summer. We are officially in the summer season, so it's really great to see uh, these temperatures continuing on with uh, most spots expecting to see a low of 12 and 13 degrees. Up in Isla Cross and Pearsland there, they will be expecting to see a low of 14 and Bonnie will be seeing the warmest with a low of 15 and we will be seeing just some clouds in sight for most spots. Murnham and Paradise Hill will be seeing a high chance of some precipitation starting off later on. 
And ending with our seven day forecast for here in the border city, we will be seeing 22 tomorrow, seeing a high uh, chance of a thunderstorm as well as precipitation. So just be prepared for that. We will be seeing a warm day with a mixture of some sun and cloud as well, but be prepared for those other conditions. We will be seeing some showers continue, continue into Thursday with 17, cooling down on Thursday and Friday, starting off the weekend, unfortunately, with some gloomier conditions. Then Saturday and Sunday, we will see some beautiful temperatures. We'll see uh, 22 on Saturday with a mixture of some sun and cloud, 24 on Sunday. So Sunday is probably going to be the nicest day, uh, seeing a lot more sun as well during the day. And then continuing into next week, we will be seeing those 22s continue on. So officially the first day of summer today, and we will be seeing those summer days continue on here in the border city. That is another look at weather forecast. We'll have more coming up after the break. Welcome back to this edition of the Pet Project, everyone. I'm joined once again with Gabrielle from the Border Paws Animal Shelter. How is everything going over there this week? Really good so far, yep. That's good to hear. And so we have kind of a special guest this week. I know I say that every week, but this one is a little <laughs> bit more special than usual. So I'll let you go ahead and introduce our uh, furry friend for the week. This is Chandler. She is a rabbit that we have here in the shelter right now. She's been here for about a month and she came in with another rabbit and the other rabbit is actually in foster to adopt and she is ready for adoption so she is ready whenever someone is interested in her well she certainly does look very cute very well behaved um, i've said it before on the show but i had bunnies growing up i lived on a farm and they're great pets they're so you know they're so much fun to uh, you know play with and, and they're just adorable soft you got to be a little careful with them because they can be a little skittish you know so maybe if uh, you've never owned a rabbit before it's certainly something you want to look into it's a little different than a dog or a cat but it, it's not yeah. it's not outside of uh, you know your skill set out there anyone so certainly if you're interested interested in picking up Chandler or even just stopping in getting to meet her you know maybe just testing the waters certainly get in touch with the the Border Paws Animal Shelter and you know stop in and say hi wonderful so moving on you guys had a big event this last weekend well you were part of a big event which was the carnival at the Lloyd Mall and so you guys had a booth out there and I, I heard it was a lot of fun I didn't have time to stop by but uh, yeah how did everything go did you guys uh, you know get to introduce a lot of people to your pets yeah, so we took puppies and we did a little puppy kissing booth. Uh, the kids absolutely loved it and to be honest, so did the adults. <laughs> um, so yeah, we got lots of people interested in puppies and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it certainly looked great. I know a couple people from uh, the station here stopped by and, and got some puppy smooches and made donations. <laughs> so that's always lovely to see, you know. So I'm really glad that everything went well with that and uh, obviously look forward to the next big event. Um, but so this coming weekend, you guys don't have any events, but you do have something kind of special going on, which is you guys are doing a volunteer orientation. So I'm always telling people to get in touch with you guys and to volunteer. And so you guys are actually going to, uh, I guess, do some orientation. So I'll let you just kind of discuss what's going on with that. Yeah, so we have a volunteer orientation this Sunday. It starts at 2 o'clock. We do ask that you just give us a call and let us know if you're coming or not, um, just so that we can plan roughly about how many people are going to come. And so it's for you to be able to come in without fully committing to volunteering. You can come in and learn what you would do with the cats and dogs and that kind of thing. And then we're also looking for volunteers for events and yard work and stuff like that as well. Perfect. So, you know, if you've ever had that thought in the back of your mind, gee, I would really like to volunteer, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what it entails. This is the perfect opportunity for you. Go tip, go dip your toes in the water, see how it feels, hang out with the pets, you know. I'm sure you're going to love it, and you'll probably want to go back every week to help out. <laughs> um, perfect. So, one last thing to touch on before we leave for the day is, uh, obviously, physical item donations. I always like to bring it up, and uh, there's a couple things you were looking looking for this week so once again I'll just let you let the people know what you're looking for so we do still need adult dog food we have roughly 10 adult dogs in our care right now so if you are looking for a dog you can come and check them out but we still need some food for them as well as we need some hay um, for our little bunny here if she doesn't get adopted she has been blowing through her hay <laughs> 
Yeah, so that's an easy one. If you live on a farm, you know, I'm sure you have some extra hay lying around. I'm, I'm sure the uh, Border Plaza Animal Shelter would greatly appreciate it. So would Chandler. So, you know, very easy one to cross off the list. If you got some extra laying around on the farm and you're stopping by town, that would be something great you could do. But that's unfortunately all the time we have for this week. So I want to thank you, Gabrielle, for chatting with us. And I want to thank Chandler for taking time to come and say hi. Yes, thank you for having us again. Pet Project is sponsored by the Pet Pad. For total pet care, think Pet Pad. Furniture set and design supplied by Furniture Gallery and Furniture House, downtown Lloydminster. So first off, Eric, thank you so much for being a part of Prime Time at Local News today. Very excited to have you here. Now, you did play here in Lloyd last summer as a part of the Vic Juba for their outdoor concert summer series with your now former band, Kane Incognito. And you've That's taken correct. this new path as a solo artist with your debut single, Memories Crawl, that just came out last week, which we're going to be talking about here in a couple of minutes. And you have this very inspiring musical journey. And now... Although many people here in Lloyd may be familiar with you, for those who may not know you so well, tell us a bit more about yourself. Um, I guess, yeah, my name's Eric Kane, and uh, I'm a singer-songwriter from Edmonton, Alberta. Um, for the last five years, I've been pushing my musical paths with my band, Kane Incognito, but that has uh, unfortunately um, come to an end. We've kind of just, over the pandemic, had our own uh, truths to kind of speak and we're all in good terms but we're all kind of moving separate ways and with that choice I just full steam ahead with my with my solo project Air Kane. Um, so yeah that's that's kind of the gist of it. If you want to know more dig deeper into the social medias. <laughs> <laughs> Dig more into the social medias to find more about you, Eric Kane, and your history in music. Because, yeah, you have an incredible musical journey. Now, how has Thank your journey you. how has your journey been as a solo artist this far? Um, it's honestly been, I mean, it's it feels like it's been a couple years already in the making just because of this uh the pandemic and everything we've gone through. It allowed me to play um a lot more by myself or not allowed me, but forced me to play by myself. And uh, with that being said, officially the last, I think month, I, I would say with the announcement um, and within over the last, I guess, two days that my single has been out, it's been absolutely amazing. The the feedback and the love and the support from the, the Cane Incognito community already that exists. It's just, it's been amazing. So. I, I'd like to say thank you, anyone who's watching that has been a part of that so far. But, but yeah, to answer the question, it's been really good. It's been nerve wracking. It's been surreal on many on many levels. But uh, I'm holding my head high, and I'm I'm confident some amazing things are going to come from it. Definitely. And your song that just came out, "Memories Crawl," I can't believe it's only been out for two days. It feels like it has been out for a lot longer because it sounds so timeless and gorgeous. And you Thank said that you. this song, <laughs> this song means so much to you, written from a very vulnerable place that brings you on such a reminiscent journey of where your music started. And it means even more to you with the KI chapter ending and with Eric yeah. Kane being a new beginning for you. And I was blown away when I first heard you play this song back in October. So when I heard it again on Spotify on Friday, I was like, wow, wow, this song is still so beautiful. So tell us a bit about the song before people download it here. Thank you. Uh, first of all, that, that literally almost brought me to tears hearing you say it. Like it is, it's very, uh, it's a very heavy song for many reasons, both of those that you said, but it, it just hits me in the feels. And it, it's, uh, I basically, I wrote the song probably four years ago, um, five years ago, almost around the idea and the feeling that I'd get every time I'd go home to the acreage that I grew up on. And that home is out west of Edmonton, um, about an hour. And I spent 20 years plus of my life out there. Um, I moved out when I was 18, but just, I guess, yeah, many years after I'd go back. And there was this one wall specifically that had this, uh, it was just a collage of all the photos of us growing up as kids and just every memory that we could possibly have really. And this wall would just trigger the 
uh, reminiscent, nostalgic vibes that I tried to capture in the song, and I think I did. I think I did just that. So <laughs> that's what it's it's supposed to just capture that reminiscent vibe. And um, yeah, <laughs> I just actually finished a lyric video that I was going to post as soon as the song hit a thousand streams. I think it has just hit a uh, hit a thousand. But I made this lyric video with all these like a collage of all the photos from my childhood and it's it as well has brought me to tears multiple times so <laughs> it's it's quite uh, incredible that it still has that effect on me for sure and i think it's going to hit a lot of chords with a lot of people as well because we do have those walls and those collages and those pictures on our walls and on our tops of our fireplaces and on shelves yeah. of our memories and of our moments and of our achievements and our failures. And it does become reminiscent for us. So I bet the writing process behind that song was quite heavy for you. It was. And I mean, I would almost say the aftermath of it was almost heavier. Like just the feelings now that I get listening to it. And especially when I put the pictures to the song in this, in this, uh, the lyric video it just it hits on a whole new level so i'm excited for people to see it and i hope i hope the song uh triggers those good vibes and those good memories and the lessons learned uh lessons learned the scars everything it's it's quite beautiful i'm proud of it for sure absolutely love that thank you so much for chatting today eric i really appreciate it thank you thank you for having me it was an absolute pleasure and that's all the time we have for our first hour of primetime local news. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good night.